it is just about time. So in the interest of time, both mine, yours, and the conventions, thank you for being here. Good evening, early evening, We've still got a lot of day left. Welcome to Ping Me, High Performance Communication in Competitive Gaming, and happy Saturday. It's uh, super cool to be here. Um, I'm happy to be here. I hope you're happy to be here. Not just in this room, but at this convention, because it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it feels good to be back, right? So what are we going to talk about today? Let me tell you what we are going to talk about today. I've given this panel before at professional development organizations uh, and even other anime or, or gaming conferences, but it's actually my first time doing it at Zenkai Con. My first time in this area at all. And can someone clear it up for me? How is it pronounced? Is it Lancaster? Lancaster? That doesn't matter. Here. Doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. Just don't call you late for dinner. That's one of those. Got it. Okay. Well, I just looked, I didn't want to, what I didn't want is one of those things where like, pronounce it wrong and then somebody looks at me funny and then they don't invite me over. That's what I was trying to do. But it is my first time here and I'm extremely grateful uh, to y'all and to the organization for letting me come on board and, and hopefully teaching you a few things. Speaking of, what is it that we're going to talk about? First thing I'm going to do is give you a brief introduction of myself because you don't know me. How do you know I'm an expert? Well, I'm going to tell you. Then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of what it is that we're talking about today. A communication model that, with any luck, will change the way you think about how you communicate in games or with anyone else in your life. We're going to take a look at a few examples of the model in action with a couple of different games. Uh, Apex Legends, World of Warcraft, and Overwatch. If any of you have actually played Overwatch and know how communications works, yeah, we're going there. And then finally, uh, you may have fallen into, you likely fall into one of two groups of people. People who have read the description and said, wow, this seems interesting, and I would like a chance at winning some cool prizes. My hair must be doing something weird. Feels like something. Or, I right, may or may not have directly or indirectly bribed. Either way, I'm grateful that you're here. My name is Daniel, and you've never heard of me. There's no reason for you to have heard of me. I'm not a famous YouTuber, I'm not a Twitter personality, I don't even work in the games industry. But. I have been playing video games for a very long time. I'm very old. And I've also been working on communications, be it uh, system development or process design. My entire career has been about establishing and improving communication between and within people and systems for I'm very old, so a very long time. I put internet, 5G internet, on private jets. So you can trust me when I say, I think I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. Man. For the benefit of the people that didn't read the description or wandered in here by accident because you were thinking this was a different panel, that's also okay. Thank you for being here. Today I'm going to show you how communication works, and when it doesn't work, why? And there's no reason that we can't use this outside of gaming as well. Maybe you are one of those people that play uh, like World of Warcraft or, or Final Fantasy XIV and you wonder why your healer isn't healing. Why are they? Maybe you go through a very particular McDonald's and they're always getting your order wrong. I'm going to show you exactly why. And I'm going to do it with something that is already established in the academic communi uh, communications discipline called the Shannon Weaver model. But I've modified it a little bit, partially to illustrate uh, some of the intricacies of how it works in games, 
And also just to kind of put a little bit of my own spin on it. The model is comprised of three different types of elements. Actors, objects, and actions. If this is too dry, I can get a little bit spicy. You tell me. Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. You tell me. I don't want to put you to sleep. I, I, I'll put a little bit of zest on it. We're getting it. I'm telling you, we're going to get into some real cool stuff. This is the driest part, but I promise this is also one of the most valuable parts. There are two actors in any uh, set of communication, a sender and a receiver. In this case, I am the sender because I am sending a message to you, you are the receiver. Whether you intend to or not, you are also sending a message to me with your body language, head nods, uh, your participation at all. You are still sending a message to me. This is a, a highly transactional relationship. Sometimes the receiver isn't always who we intended to be if there's an eavesdropper. But in the case of games, that's not super common. Just one of those things to keep in mind. There are three different objects in the model. We'll cover the first two and then circle back for the third. The first object of note is the message. That is the actual content of the expression that I, the sender, am sending to you. It's the words that I'm speaking or the images that the slide is presented. I don't know why the thing is coming out with like all these dots and whatever, but whatever. Such as The channel is the method of transmission that the message is being sent. So me talking to you is sending a message of this is what a channel is over an auditory channel, and the graphic is a visual channel. Not all messages and not all channels are built the same. Where's your brain brother? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to tell you. I'm so funny. Not all messages are built the same in that not all messages have the same utility. Where utility can be measured by accuracy, timeliness, or actionability. Have you ever gotten an email from Domino's Pizza with a coupon? Has that coupon ever been for a salad? Who orders a salad from Domino's? That is a low utility message. Because it's a salad from Domino's, you're really not gonna do anything about it. But the text message that you get that says your delivery order is on the way, that is a high utility message because it tells you you got to put pants on before you answer the door. Not necessary. Uh, probably should. Sure. Not all channels are built the same. What do I mean by that? Well, not all channels are suited to carry the same type of message. And I'm going to illustrate it with this example. I'm going to tell you about my favorite salad. It has a bunch of arugula, and spinach, and tomatoes. It was actually, uh, the, the dressing that I like is a tomato-based production. And because I like to spoil myself, I throw down for a lot of cheese on it too. I am watching my carbs though. So I don't like to put on a lot of croutons, I just put one really big crouton on and tell myself that it's okay. And this is a picture of my favorite salad. Mm, there. There it is. That's my favorite salad. That's the joke. I just described to you the exact same thing. But these two channels are not equally equipped to deliver the same message when I tell you that's my favorite salad. It's a pizza. It's also the same reason why a lot of people will argue over what's better, the movie or the book. The answer is the book. All the time. Every time. And the reason is, a book can take paragraphs or pages to describe a scene, whereas a movie or a TV adaptation may only have a couple of minutes or seconds or just a couple of frames to, to establish something. 
Moving on to the actions. Each actor is responsible for a respective action. The sender encodes the message, and the receiver decodes it. Encoding is the craft of packaging the message in a way that can be decoded. I'm speaking to you in English, I'm using what I think is a relatively easy to understand graphic, so that these are things that you can understand. If I were to speak in Spanish, I'm not sure everyone would understand. Also, my Spanish is terrible. I'm horribly out of practice. And why is this particularly important in high performance communication? It's because this is an asymmetrical relationship. The act of encoding is way more burdensome than the act of decoding by its nature. It is up to the sender to encode the message in such a way that it is easy and fast for the receiver to decode. We'll actually see a couple of examples of that. And this is also one of those grammar joke examples. I'm full of dad jokes. If you don't like dad jokes, you are in the wrong room. But if you do, nice to meet you. Yeah, I got one. All right, I'll take it. Let's eat grandma and let's eat grandma. But it's the same message, but just a slight change in the encoding that changes the meaning entirely. And that's why it is up to the sender to make sure that they are sending the message, they are encoding it in a way that can be understood. 99% of, and this is not a, an objective statistical measure, but my anecdotal observation, 99% of failures of communication are because of that right there, because the sender fails to encode the message in a way that can be understood. It's not what you say, it's what the other person hears. I told you that there were three objects. But I've only covered two so far. I want to throw it out there. Who thinks they know what the third one is? Just shout it out. Maybe you get a sweet prize. Get it. The receiver is the third object. The message and the sender is the uh, two objects. The message and the channel are the two objects. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. So there is a third object. What is it? The receiver. Not quite. The receiver is an actor. I don't know. Interpretation. Context is important and we'll get to that. Form? Sorry? Form? I can't hear that. Like what's based on? Form? Not quite. So that's actually a concept called the meta message, and that's super cool, but that's also a level deeper than we're ready to go. I'm just going to give it to you. Unless you got one more. Thank you. Not quite. That's all part of the, that's all attributes kind of above the channel. Okay, sorry. The third object is noise. Noise can be defined as any external stimuli that acts on the channel, compromising its ability to carry that message. If you were to talk amongst yourselves while I kept talking, and this entire side of the room was intent on listening to me, it might compromise the ability for you to hear it because there's a lot more going on. Not all noise is necessarily bad. I mean, think about it. We have, we have these like noise-making machines to help us fall asleep. Noise-canceling headphones, the way they work, it's really funny to me. The way noise-canceling headphones work is they take outside sound noise and then generate another noise to like counterbalance it. It's really, it's really bad. And even though it's not always bad, it is in high performance communication something that must always be controlled. Sometimes it's easy. When we think about uh, how many how many times have you played a game with your buddy and their dog is barking in the background. Or 
they're playing Spotify or something like that, and you just hear the music coming through on the headphones. And it's a song you really don't like, and you don't want to tell them to turn it off, but you kind of do. That's noise, because it compromises the channel. And we're going to see a couple more examples of noise in different ways in some of these examples. But before we get there, I'm happy to report that you are now complete experts in the communication model. Congratulations, you just finished a communications 101 course. Woo. I like the guy that got it memorized. Like I haven't, I've, I've never played Apex Legends, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, or Kingdom Hearts. I am the world's worst gamer, but I just like the guy in the last line. So let's take a look at some of these examples. Uh, first thing we're going to look at is two uh, examples of Apex Legends from the same tournament. I want to say it was either earlier this year or maybe uh, late last year. Uh, a World of Warcraft pickup group, and then yes, we are going to get to Overwatch at some point, kind of. An important note about this, though. Good communication is not a substitute for execution. How you perform in the game is still 99% execution. But two players or two teams of comparable skill, the one with the better communication almost always has a, an edge. How significant that edge is depends on a lot of things. But let's get into it. Let's see some of these examples. And I hope audio is. Forgive me if it comes in way too loud, way too fast. Fighting Lava City over here is one. That's a better shot. Yeah, you're looking good. Because that's done completely stunned. Yeah, I don't know. I thought it flatlined every day, but it does seem like a fucking havoc in the second day. I still have a bull. Do you want to be the purple shadow bull? Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to say. Is that even anyone that gives it? Because I can give it to you. Okay. I'm like buying this rock. I'm going to start looking at this Gibby. He's like right here in the... Heavy playing is actually kind of black, but... Yeah, it is what I think. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking. I don't know what's going on, I just see the video on the bubble in your thing. Um, I don't actually know if those subtitles are accurate, but they're close enough for my, you know, for, for this kind of example. So that was uh, Renegade. It's not doing a whole heck of a lot, not a whole lot of action. Uh, this one is going to be liquid with a pretty dramatic change of pace. How much time do you have back to? What's the call now? 300. Give me, give me uh, 60. It was there, cost the call now. I need your pack, I need your pack. I'm trying to let them break it. Right here. I don't see it, I don't see it. We have to watch this out. It's out to the party. I think it's people upstairs right now. Tom, do not, do not overextend it. Tom. Yeah. North and West Brennan. He's looking to push the south. He's looking to push the south. I'm holding still, okay? Let us know if you need us. Tom, keep looking for kills on North and West. Is there going to have rotations on the north end? Or on the west end, actually? Tell all those kills. There's an Arctic looking south for us. There's an Arctic looking south. I'm going to. Tom, 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 I'm going to. Tom,
was, good, or poor communication. Just throw some out there for me. Liquid was very calm and very precise, and it took the so the first example you're saying was kind of a low action, so there it was it was calm, and the second one was a little bit more frantic. Yes. Cool. Give me somebody give me one more. Hit me. The second one was making sure to block the reaction of the animals time recording. Sorry, one more time for me. The second one was calling out directions of enemies with its time before the game. Yes. And that's actually one of the first things that I observed. In both instances, there were uh, indications or communications trying to express a location. Over there was, uh, or over here was the term used by renegades. Okay, cool. Where's here? I don't know what that means. That was followed up with a little bit more specific detail. We'll actually get to that in the third. But compare that to how Liquid did their communication. They used cardinal directions, saying north northwest or south southwest. That meant that there was less uncertainty, and the encoding made it easy to decode. In the first example, uh, there was a lot less chatter. There was a lot less uh, activity, but. There wasn't a whole lot of need to talk. So there was, whatever was said was not a whole lot of utility in those messages. There were some, some messages of support, but by and large it was superfluous. Compared to the second example with Liquid where everything was important, every single thing, very noisy, very active. And look, I promised you takeaways. And we're gonna to get to a, a broader takeaways, but I, this is this one is too important to, to not let slide. Repetition is the bane of high performance communication. Repetition is the bane of high performance. That was the joke. And why is repetition the bane? Because you're saying the same message. It doesn't have any additional utility just because you say it twice. It may express some sense of urgency, but trust that your team understands that something is urgent. Bubble on me, bubble on me, bubble on me, bubble on me, bubble on me. Cool, I got it. Gotta throw down a bubble. And if repetition is the bane of high performance communication, redundancy is the blessing. So let's think back to that first example where Renegade said over here. Followed it up with Lava City. And then what did they do? Did you see? They marked it. They expressed the same message over two channels at the same time. They said over there, so there was a, 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 a Lava City, so there was a, a uh, auditory kind of communication expression of the location to pay attention to and a visual one with the marker. Redundancy is the less repetition. No, avoid that. You do need to ask yourself though, even though they used uh, redundant channels to communicate, was that optimal? Maybe. I don't know. I don't play your next lecture. But in your communications while you're playing games, that's something that you're going to need to consider if that channel is even available. Moving away from Apex Legends, let's, uh, let's take a look at World of Warcraft. This is a. Do we have any people that played World of Warcraft or play World of Warcraft? Right. Kind of sometimes, maybe. Uh, for the people, if, if I may call call on you for a hot second, pick up groups, good, bad, or indifferent. Shaky, right? You, you never can't tell. Well, this this was a pickup group in a dungeon that I don't really know what it is, but let's find out how they do. Uh, they focus guys on what I do to help them. And so if I call the beat to break, get ready to break it. Make sure you guys are also doing the second part during the 
Now the doom card, doom card gets the left. All right, two switch, get ready to kill the death lord. Four three and five. Three, two, one, boom. Spread over trampoline. If it's a hunter or a main, let him do it himself. Do a five coming out on five on the right side. Here comes trampoline. Barricade. It's right in the middle, guys. Get back onto purple. Just back up, back onto purple. Kill a deep fire spear on the right. Make sure you never get on getting hit in the fire. A lure in five. Get back into purple. Grab a door before we move. A lure in three, two, one, two. I don't play World of Warcraft, so I have no idea what was going on. Give me, uh, give me one thing that you observed. Hit it. Uh, one thing I really like that he did that I took over was on the wall. He said, alert, play, and three, two, one. So he's giving his teammates a heads up, saying like, hey, this is about to happen, and then like, leaving them up to the wall. That's a, that's a great example of actually a uh, really, really good high performance communication set. Allure of Flame in three, two, one. That's the really good encoding that makes it so that it's easy for anyone listening to decode. Give me one more. Uh, precise uh, commands for specific levels that you play, let's say, for the healer, uh, for them to get to the level, and also for the hunters, they know what to do with their counterparts. Owning the role. If you know your class and you know your job, do it. And, and I'm going to trust you as the as the raid leader. I'm going to trust that you you're going to do it. And there was one more back there. Uh, yeah, I heard fire on the left. I'm assuming danger is the motion. So a a clear direction of 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 warning that gave a, a relative location to say uh, as an instruction. Is that what you're looking for? Yep. These are all fantastic. And you guys know way more than me. Because the first time I looked at this, I was like, yeah, there's some good stuff. But I actually had a chance to meet with a guy named Dan Dadan, who at one point was the eighth ranked paladin in the entire world. Just bumped into him at a bar one time. I said, hey, can you tell me what's going on in this video? And he was able to clear up a few things. Some of the things that we already pointed out. One of my favorite things about this video is there are parts of pure silence. There is no side talk, or such a, a, a reduction of side talk, which is partially about forming teams and, and coming up with that agreement. But the way that the raid leader did it is they established conditions to say, this is when you can call out. Otherwise, don't, don't worry about it. Everything else, I've got it. Trust me, trust me that I'm doing my role, you do yours. Which is not to say that you can't speak ever, but these are the conditions in which you can. And uh, uh, going back to the Allure of Flame in 3, 2, 1, this was actually one that, that was close, near and dear to my heart, because I was part of uh, a couple of people, and, and uh, uh, we did WoW groups every now and again, uh, casually, when I tried. And one of the things they did is they always used acronyms or initialisms or things that I wasn't, jargon, that I wasn't necessarily familiar with. And then I kind of had to scratch my head and say, what does that even mean? By reducing the burden, instead of saying AOF, now, Allure of Flame in three, two, one. Again, they're doing the job of as a, a sender, owning the part of that asymmetric relationship, taking on the burden of encoding the message in a way that can be easily decoded. And this is actually one of my favorite examples of why isn't your healer healing you? Because you're saying, heal me. Cool. Who's me? Instead of that, say, heal Dan to Dan, or whatever your name is. It's your name. You can go ahead and say it. There's no rules against that. And it makes the job of the healer so much easier because then they know, here's my instruction and here's what I need to do because who I need to do it for. 
And the last was uh, this, uh, I think one of these examples over here, the high utility message. Every single thing was a crystal clear instruction. It was like a samurai. There's no wasted motion. There's no wasted effort. There's no wasted words. Every single thing was exactly what the team needed to hear, no more and no less. So every single member knew exactly what to do, and there were no questions. I love that example. It's so cool. And unfortunately, we have to go from that to Overwatch. <laughs> and um, my favorite part about putting this together was I tried. I tried so hard to find gameplay examples of Overwatch that wasn't just pure cacophony. I don't know what's going on. Everybody is just yelling all the time. It stresses me out. So, instead of coming up with uh, an example, instead of coming up with an example, I was able to find uh, some video uh, courtesy of uh, Action Esports with an interview with uh, a couple of professional Overwatch players. Oh,不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，不得不，
team members that you're familiar with and any new team members, strangers. And not to put the entire burden on the sender, there is some burden on the receiver. You can't just listen to what they're saying. You have to try to understand what they're saying. Are you hearing what they're telling you or what they're trying to say? These were the three takeaways that I came up with very early on. And I'm happy to say, actually, that there is a fourth because Dan to Dan pointed out one more for me that is probably the most important one. Have fun. People want to play and people want to communicate with people who they have fun with. It's a game. Maybe you take it a little seriously, but have fun. If you're not having fun, turn the mic off. Put the head, put the headset on, because it's not doing anybody anything. What do you think so far? Did I did I learn you how to talk good? Oh, we ain't done yet. Because I heard you want to win some prizes. Maybe. You tell me. You want to win some stuff? You want to play a game? Well, let's get to it. We talked about the model. We talked about, uh, or we witnessed the model in action with a couple of different games. And we see that the model shows us some things, but there's something else that the model is missing. Shout it out. When? Personal context. Was it? Personal when? context. Why? Because the uh, word can mean one thing, while uh, one person will say the word can mean something else to somebody else. Context was part of the meta messaging and everything that wrapped around, which is the thing that influenced how we choose the channels we choose, how we encode the message we choose. You said why? I said because what? one word means some, uh, one thing while the same word means somebody, somebody else. It's missing from the model, but what I was looking for was why. The model tells us how we communicate and what in the message, but it doesn't tell us why. Why did you answer? That's a good question, huh? Why did you answer? Because I thought I would know the answer to the question. And you wanted to be engaged? Yes, I wanted to be engaged. Or did you want to win a prize? I just wanted to know why I learned something. I learned something from the message. There was, so there was a motivation for you. And yours was more of an intrinsic motivation. You just wanted to win a prize. I just thought I knew the answer. You just wanted to win a prize. <laughs> I might be right. <laughs> <Go later. laughs> so when we talk about why we communicate, uh, there are effectively three motivated reasons. These are not exhaustive, but by and large, if we're going to, to, to kind of bucket these up, there is collaboration, compromise, and compete. Those are the motivated reasons of why we do what we do. We say what we say, how we say it. And it's the circumstances that determine which of these approaches we take. I love Overcooked 2. That is one of my favorite games of all time. And if you think you're a good communicator with your, with your partner, with your teammate, with your colleague, play this game and it will highlight every single thing you're doing right or wrong. And this is a model of collaboration. I win you. There's a, a very kind of, you're engaged with the other person and you have a mutual interest. Or sorry, you have a shared interest, a, com a common interest. A mutual interest is in these Mario Party alliances. Friendships have been made and shattered under the guises of Mario Party alliances. I still don't talk to Derek from 2012 for what he did today. It's an I win, you lose, you win, you lose. Competing interest, it's fewer and further between, but I, I harken back to the days of like the Halo 3 lobbies, when anybody can chirp at anybody else. Is this still a common thing that you tell me? Is this the kind of thing that still happens maybe in Call of Duty lobbies or anything else where you can, you can communicate with the enemy? Not that I know of. 
That still happens in Call of Duty. Still happens in Call of Duty? It's like free for all. Yeah, yeah, so it happens. It's just not as common. But it's definitely a reason why. You want to get near opponent's head, you want to give him a little bit of a chirp. So this is the part where I promised you an interaction, uh, sorry, yes, an optional interactive exercise. It's in Paris. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, if you want to participate, again, completely optional, uh, pair up with someone, and one of you is going to grab the sheet laid, uh, with the, the label R, and the other one is going to grab a sheet with the, uh, the label J. Go ahead and do that. If you want to be motivated, you get, uh, you get a sweet prize. Maybe a Kenzie Black shirt. So one person grabs R, one person grabs J. Uh, not the actual label, but the sheet underneath. Oh, sorry. For that. <laughs> one of you uh, should should have a, a thing at the top saying Dr. Roland, and the other one should say Dr. Jones. There's like two sheets there. So, here are the instructions. There are two of you, Dr. Jones and Dr. Roland. You need to read and understand your sheet. You cannot share your sheet with your uh, compatriot. The scenario is this. Dr. Roland and Dr. Jones both need a supply of a fruit called the Ugly Orange. If you know this exercise, please don't shout out any spoilers. I, playing the role of Farmer Mendoza, have every single Ugly Orange in the world today. Your job is to convince your alternate why you need the oranges and how many you should get versus how many they should get. Keep in mind, every orange that they get is an orange that you don't. Think back to the model. Think about how you want to encode your message. Think about You have five minutes, and after those five minutes are up, uh, I'll ask for a volunteer or two to uh, tell us what they think, and enjoy these sweet, sweet tunes from Chocobo and Chocobo.
section and you've seen this art with the wild colors going on that's muddy melly so we got uh, 15 bucks for that and 25 dollars for void Bug, another artist uh, down in the marketplace that does some really cool stuff no what do you want us to put money on i want you to tell me who gets one of you can come up and tell me which one of you gets how many lunches you don't have to both come up unless you really want to. You can if you want to. Either way, you, you get you're getting something out of it. Um, Speak to this yeah, microphone yeah. if you'd be so kind. Art. Oh, here. Oh, I even see the mic. Mike, go up to the mic. Yeah. And what's your name? Uh, my name is Mike. Mike, nice to meet you. That's. I mean, we split it 50-50. 50-50? So one of you gets 1,500 oranges and the other one gets 1,500 oranges? How did you arrive at that? Um, it's okay. It's, it's so, totally fine. So, uh... Two. <laughs> I asked him how his wife... Is this hilarious? There was a theory so, so, that... Um, we, valid we're and or invalid threat. I asked him how his wife was doing. Oh, so we got some head cannon going on in here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> expanded universe. Yeah. Okay. But we did find out that he was both trying to help certain types of animals. Yeah. Okay. So both of you understood that you were not necessarily competitors. You were still trying to achieve something relatively noble. Yeah. yeah. 
and that's why you said 50 50 split. Right. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> Find me later, I'll get you some sweet stuff. <laughs> Did anybody else have anything different? Come on up. For, for us, because I did this one in one of my psychology classes already. Oh, you already did this one? Yeah. Oh, did. No, get out of here! No, I didn't. He did not. Okay, so we'll take it. What was, uh, what was your proposal? I told him that he could purchase all the oranges and we would make a deal that he would not use, or he would not dispose of water or whatever. Well. He would what? Sorry, he would not dispose of whatever was left over. He would not dispose of whatever was left over. And we can go from there. Yes. I gave him money and I got the oranges. Dr. Rollins in the room, please go to paragraph five, line two. What part of the orange do you need? Dr. Jones is of the room. Go to paragraph four. Line two, what part of the orange do you need? The syrup to make the juice. Juice. Good. In closing, there was a guy named Buckminster Fuller. And he said, when I'm working on a problem, I never think about beauty. But when I have finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it is wrong. And this is less an academic principle 